Hey friends, I come to you today from a parking lot at the Royal Farms gas station in White Marsh, Maryland, not far from where that bridge just got destroyed, preaching for a special Good Friday service for my friend Scott Toole and the great people of Rosedale Baptist Church. But I wanted to talk to you about Romans chapter 12. And I know by the time you hear this or see this, uh, we will have celebrated Easter at our respective churches. And so happy late Easter to you. But looking forward to jumping into our next chapter of scripture. And wow, what an appropriate chapter and verse for just this weekend of the gospel. Uh, look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where the Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I suppose that if you have been a student of the Bible or have been around spiritual things for any length of time, that those verses ring familiar to you. And yet I hope there's a new sense of awe and perhaps even a new level of understanding to those verses now that we have covered chapters one through 11. Because think about it, chapters one through 11 are that great indicative section of Romans. These are the things that are true about God, about salvation, about mankind, about your redemption, all of it. And now here are the ways by which you ought to behave in light of what you now know to be true. So verse, verses, well, chapters 12 through 16 are the imperative, represent the imperative section of the book of Romans. Here's what we do with what we know. Now, both are important. Sometimes if we're not careful, we'll get the doing ahead of the knowing or of the being. We ought to do what, we ought to, what we're supposed to do based upon knowing what we're supposed to know and being who we're supposed to be. So your identity in Christ is paramount to your behavior for Christ. If we're not careful, we'll just preach behavior but if all we do is preach behavior, instead of talking about the transformation that is only possible through salvation in Jesus, then all we're going to do is create actors, people that know how to put on on the outside, people, know, people who know how to mirror fruit, people who know how to act the part on stage, but have never experienced true transformative power. And that's why I think the, the order here is so vital. So did you hear how the verse began? I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So there's a whole lot right there. First of all, the Apostle Paul is speaking to brethren. So the letter to the Romans is a letter to the believers that are gathering in the church at Rome at that point. Remember, some are Jewish believers, some are Gentile believers, but they are one in Christ. And the Apostle Paul calls them brethren. He doesn't make the distinction. Okay, my Jewish brethren, my Gentile brethren. No, we're one in Christ. That's the point he makes in Galatians chapter five. And it's the point he's been making for the last three chapters. So I beseech you. The word beseech there means I'm strongly urging you. Uh, this is your choice. You must make a choice about your own level of commitment to Christ. And I would say that to you that are listening or watching right now, that I cannot make that choice for you, nor can you make that choice for me. We have to make our own choice based upon right information to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, now, Here's the basis, by the mercies of God. So we might say, well, God's been merciful to us, so we ought to live for him. And that would certainly be true, but I think that would be a little bit trite because what is the Apostle Paul saying in fullness here? 
in Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. In other words, by what we have been talking about for 11 chapters, by all of these examples of God's undeserved goodness in our life. We are the sinners. We are the ones that have been living in opposition to God. We are the ones that were lost. And yet, what did Jesus do? He came, he found us, he died for us. He offers us salvation. Uh, Through our belief in him and his finished work, we can have the very righteousness of God, power over sin, adopted uh, among the the beloved. Uh, We can have uh, the earnest of the spirit inside of us, Jesus praying for us. I mean, we can go on and on and on. And I think what the Apostle Paul is driving at here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 is that based upon all of these ways that God has been so good and so merciful to us, what should be our response? So Paul uses a very vivid illustration from the Old Testament sacrificial system to demonstrate metaphorically what our response should be if we apprehend the goodness and mercy of God in our lives. So watch it again, verse one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Present your bodies. The language there is the language of sacrifice. So in the Old Testament, when the priest would offer an offering, he would present the body representing the life of that animal, that goat, that sheep, that lamb, and that bull. And that that animal would be sacrificed uh, to the Lord. But watch the difference between the Old Testament sacrifice and the New Testament sacrifice. The Old Testament sacrifice was offered for mercy, for a covering. I'm bringing this offering so that God will be merciful. It it provided a basis for mercy. But here in the New Testament, uh, Paul is saying, no, because of mercy, offer this sacrifice. So that would tell me that the metaphor that the Apostle Paul is using here is not the sin offering, is not the burnt offering of the Old Testament. In fact, there's really only one type of offering that fits the criterion that the Apostle Paul is giving us in verse number one. And that is what we call the peace offering. So there was an offering in the Old Testament called the peace offering. And in the peace offering, a person would simply come and offer a sacrifice to God as not for peace, not in order to obtain peace, but because there was peace. So maybe a better way to understand it would be the peace offering was the thanksgiving offering. It was an offering, a free will offering, was not compulsory, but was a free will offering that somebody could make to say, thank you. Thank God for his provision. Thank God for his blessings. And I'm offering this offering as a thank you for benefits already received. That's the point that the Apostle Paul is making here. It's an offering for benefits already received. Now here's what's interesting. When somebody would offer a peace offering in the Old Testament, the meat offered for that offering would go to three different places. The the priest that would actually do the slaying of the animal and the actual sacrifice of that animal would receive the shoulder portion, uh, a coveted portion of the animal for himself. But then some of the animal would also go to the general cause of the Levites and priests who lived according to the sacrifices of God's people, right? They didn't have jobs like everybody else. They didn't have land to till and crops to raise. So they received the tithe and they received the offerings of God's people. So that meat would go to that priest, would go to the priests, uh, the house of God, we'll say it that way, And then number three, that meat would go to the offerer. He would get some of that meat to bring home and because of no refrigeration, they would typically have a feast 
that very day and be able to celebrate the sacrifice and celebrate the goodness of God. I find there a great principle, and that is when the peace offering sacrifice was made, everybody benefited. Obviously, some of that offering went to the Lord. I forgot about that part. It's a sacrifice to the Lord. So obviously the Lord is honored, but some of that sacrifice went to the priest and the priestly class. And so the house of God, the church is edified, others are blessed, but then some of that meat came home. And so there was a blessing for me. You know, when you live your life for Jesus Christ, when you present your body a living sacrifice to God, when you say, not my, not my will, but thine be done. When you say, Lord, I want my life to be about you, about your will, about your purpose. Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. When you have that spirit and yield your body in that way, everybody wins. It's a blessing to God to whom you're making the offering. It's a blessing to the house of God, to the people of God to the leaders in your life that are encouraging you and are working alongside of you. And it's a great blessing to you. The greatest blessing you can be to yourself is to live for God. There's so much more there, but I thought what a great illustration that the Apostle Paul chose under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to help us to understand that. Okay, let's quickly move. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now think about that, your body a living sacrifice. So that would be odd because in the Old Testament, a sacrifice was that which you killed. You slayed the animal. It no longer had life. There was no future for it other than the sacrifice itself. And yet the Bible says that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice sacrifice. So this is not a commitment that says, okay, I'm going to give my life as a martyr for God. Although I think that every true believer ought to be willing to die for Christ. No, it's not a willingness to die for Christ that most Christians struggle with. No, it's a willingness to live day by day for Christ, to make a million little sacrifices in our desires, in our in our schedule, in our preferences, in our, you can go on and on. And so it's the living sacrifice that God expects of us, that we have a spirit of yieldedness. The Lord, I wanna represent you. I want my life and what I do in my body. Uh, That would comprise the things I see, the things I hear, the things I taste, the things I smell, the things I say, um, the things I touch all of what encompasses this physical corporeal corporeal world, I want to live for God. That's it, presenting my body a living sacrifice. Now, I don't have a clock, so I don't know how long I've taken today, but I'm feeling like I've probably taken up all my time. So we're gonna stop right there in verse number one. And then we'll come back to verse number two tomorrow. There's just too much for me to say right now to squeeze it in. So chew on that and we'll jump into verse number two next time. Hope you'll join us. God bless you, my friends.